Hey there, everybody. It's Corey with The Abundant Artist, and I am excited to uh, chat with you today uh, to, and introduce you to Patricia Vargas. Um, Patricia is a uh, acrylic and is how she describes herself, uh, based in California. She's also the owner of Parima Print Shop. Did I get that right? Parima? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, her work's been featured by companies like Anthropology. She's been featured on Design Sponge. Uh, she's been on HGTV, Better Home Gardens. Um, she's all over the place on the internet. Uh, got a big society six shop and a print shop, online print shop. So I'm excited to talk with her today. Um, we're going to cover things like passive income, multiple streams of income, uh, selling prints versus selling originals, all that kind of stuff, good stuff. Um, I met Patricia because uh, she's a member of the Abundant Artist Association, which is our professional trade association and artists. And we were talking inside of our community and she was sharing some of the things that she's doing. I said, man, you gotta, you gotta come on uh, the, the podcast and talk about all this neat stuff that you're doing because I, I don't think that uh, many artists know that you can even do some of the things that you're doing. So uh, I'm excited to have you here. Thank you so much for being here. I'm super excited to get this conversation going today. <laughs> awesome. So Patricia, uh, you mentioned in your you mentioned in your bio on your website that you got you got started uh, selling art by selling prints, which is sort of the opposite direction that a lot of artists get started in. Yeah, yeah, I definitely did it backwards. Um, so. I got started selling art prints sort of out of necessity um, at that time in my life when I was first starting to figure out how I could be a working artist. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a lot of money to mm -hmm. invest and I also didn't have a lot of physical space. Um, so I couldn't really build up this large inventory of giant paintings or even like medium sized paintings. Um, so I had to get creative on how I could beef up my little Etsy shop without investing too much else and mm -hmm. without it taking up what little space I had. Um, and so I had heard that people were making prints from their original paintings and I thought, perfect. So I'm going to take like the five paintings that I have uh -huh. and I'm going to make them into prints and then I'm going to take those prints and I'm going to crop them even more and make additional like mini complementary prints out of that. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So then I had like a small inventory. I probably had like 15 items on my Etsy store by the time I opened, which is mm -hmm. a lot better than having like five because then that just looks sad. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, so you, you, you literally took like, you made prints from your small originals and then you cropped the originals and made different prints from crop sections of your, of your paintings. Yeah. And they look like completely different prints. That's yeah. amazing. That's so great. <laughs> <laughs> so and it's, if you were selling on Etsy, it sounds like you were selling like small, inexpensive prints. Is that correct? Oh, I started off small because I didn't really know, um, I didn't know too much about printing. So mm -hmm. I didn't know how big things could be scaled. So I was a little scared. So I just kept things pretty much in proportion to the size that they were. <laughs> right. Um, but then later, because I'm a giant digital nerd, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I've been using Photoshop since it was like Photoshop 7, I learned that, yeah, <laughs> a long time ago, I learned that people could paint digitally and I thought that was really fascinating. So I like dove into that digital painting world. And since digital paintings don't have physical paintings, I could only sell prints from those. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. So then that ended up adding to the amount of prints that I had versus the amount of originals I had. And then I became known as an art print shop. <laughs> so now um what percentage of your sales are so that that's it's been like five years something like that yeah i'm entering my fifth year soon yeah um so what percentage of your sales now come from originals versus prints um it's still about i want to say like 85 percent original or prints sorry prints. Okay. Yeah. that is where i focus most of my time Mm -hmm. um, but I do 
I do want to sell more originals and I have done like uh, commissions and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but definitely prints kind of overtook everything else. And then I was like, well, I'll just run with it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, the piece behind you on the wall, was that done uh, uh, anal in analog or digital? <laughs> That's a real painting. That's a, uh, well, I, I don't like to say real versus okay, digital. That. It's a acrylic painting. It's an acrylic painting. Okay. <laughs> um, I, 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 we, we do have a lot of digital artists in the community. And I think that they're like some of the things you can do with digital, you can't do with, uh, you know, acrylic or oil or whatever and vice versa. Um, so I, I'm not a big fan of the idea of, of calling it real versus. Really? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, you know, whatever you call it is fine. I just want to point out to all the digital artists out there, like, is just as valid and I think uh Patricia what you're what you've done shows that it is just as valid yeah and you know because I had a really hard time finding examples of digital artists that also sold like originals and mm -hmm. I I didn't find too many people like that and so I kind of felt a little bit weird that I was selling digital paintings mm -hmm. And I didn't quite know how to explain it to customers that mm -hmm. there is no original from this. And I still get asked that a lot. Right. Oh, people say, oh, why can't I buy the original? Yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, it doesn't exist. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. We've had, um, you know, the, our last episode was with um, Stephanie Law, who has been around, you know, you talked about doing Photoshop 7. She started with Photoshop 1. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she, she paints both uh, in oil and other, and other media as well as digitally. Mm -hmm. And she's done a lot of um, really, you know, go back and listen to the episode. I, I won't go into everything she's done, but she paints it digitally too. And I, you know, she's like a pioneer of painting and um, selling stuff online. So it's really interesting to see how this evolves from yeah. you know what she started with to what you're doing now and all that kind of stuff. Definitely. Um, okay, and so, I just add to that real quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I feel like, especially now with things like the iPad and uh, apps like Procreate, I feel like mm -hmm. digital painting is being more widely accepted because so many people ha have the technology accessible to do it now. Yeah. Um, so I, f I feel like there's a little bit of a turn there. Yeah, the and there's certainly there are people who value like they want to see like the oil texture and they want to see like thick paint and all that kind of stuff. But for me, I don't care so much about whether something's digital or, or uh, you know, analog. I care about whether or not it's interesting mm -hmm. and I care about the artist's vision and voice. And that doesn't matter. Like the media doesn't matter. It's about the artist's vision. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, that your mother was a landscape painter. Is that correct? She painted landscapes. Uh -huh. she but didn't she, do it professionally. She, she wasn't a professional painter. No. Okay. So was she supportive of you jumping into a professional painting career? I think, as with all parents, they're a little bit hesitant, uh, but she definitely understood, um, and she's kind of the one who bought me like my first paint sets and and canvas and all that. Um, so I, for the most part, I had support, but she was like, all right, are you really going to be able to make this into a legit career? <laughs> uh -huh. And I'm like, I think I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so you said that your, uh, your mom and your sister are super important and they helped the, help you create the name of your print studio, right? Yes. So uh -huh. how do they, how do they support you or influence your, your career and your business? Well, my sister's the one who gave me the idea to become a working artist in the first place. She's the one who kind of like pushed me towards it. <laughs> um, so I had been working on a painting one day and she came in and she was like, oh my goodness, like you need to sell your work. And I just looked at her and I thought she was crazy. I was like, nobody makes money from their art. Like it just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so at the time she had a pretty like medium size interior design blog. And this was when Instagram was fairly new. So mm -hmm. she snapped a picture, put it on Instagram, shared it with her followers and people started asking 
who's the artist? Where is it from? Like, where can I buy it? Where can I learn more? And so she's like, see, people do want to buy your stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so that was like the, that was like the flip of the switch that I needed. And That's so awesome. So awesome that she was so supportive. Yeah. And and I was the one who was like, no, like that's never gonna happen, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And um, since my mom is also very creative, so I always had that support. And no matter what I did, she would always support me. So that's actually how I came up with the name Parima. So my name Patricia, and then my sister's name Ariana, and my mom's name is Maria. So it's uh, the first two initials of each. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I love this so much this idea that, oh, you know, nobody makes a living from their art. But if you go back and listen to the archives of our podcast, we've probably, you're, I think your episode, you're in the 30s, I can't remember exactly which, which one. So, but every single artist that we've interviewed is somebody who makes a significant living from their art. And we've got, you know, a backlog of a couple dozen artists that were, that, that have, that are, have agreed to come on the show and, uh, and talk to us about how they make their careers work. And the, these are all artists that are operating outside of the gallery system. They're doing their own weird things. Uh, and, and I say weird because it's the kind of stuff that a lot of artists don't talk to each other about. Yeah. Um, just out of curiosity for you, like, you know, before joining the, um, the Abundant Artists Association, did you, do you have other artists in your life that you get together with and talk, and talk shop with? about the, the business of art? Um, not really other artists, but mm -hmm. I have surrounded myself with um, other creative business owners, not necessarily in my industry, but they could be like um, wedding photographers or uh, my sister also has her own business. So um, she's like, we're like buddy buddies with that. That's awesome. <laughs> um, but I have joined like the savvy business owner group and um when i did marie forleo's b school we had like b school meetups that were local and things like that so it's always good to have a support system outside of your friends and family who know exactly what you're going through and can help you work out all of the issues and maybe even spark new ideas right um yeah so even joining like a facebook group for artists or entrepreneurs is a big help yeah, yeah. I'm always uh, I'm always uh, impressed when artists jump into B school because it's not cheap. You know, it's like two grand to join B school. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I <laughs> I know. I definitely saved for it, but um, we can get into that a little bit later. But I definitely think it was absolutely worth it. Nice. So over on the Facebook Live, um, you got a shout out from Matt LeBlanc, who uh, is a, a painter in Canada, and we've featured him on the Abundant Artist a bunch of times. Says he's seen your work before and it's awesome. So Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So you started selling prints. You were you you your sister sent a picture on Instagram and people were like, where do I buy it? So yeah. did you just start an Etsy shop at that point? No. <laughs> no. It took me about six months of researching um, mm -hmm. and planning before I finally opened my Etsy shop. So it was a lot like the logistics of how to even make prints happen, right? Mm -hmm. Like how do you make a painting into a digital file and then where do you take that digital file? Mm -hmm. um, and also setting up a new business, uh, all the legal things associated with that required by like state and city. Mm -hmm. And then during that time I had switched my Instagram account to a business account which they didn't have at the time officially so i just switched my username to my new business name mm -hmm. and i started posting um like progress shots and just sharing my process with people and i also put up a coming soon newsletter sign up link at the top and so people would sign up and be like oh i'm gonna open my shop in january so i gave myself a deadline I was like, I'm going to open up in January. Um, and probably by the end of it, I only had like 20 people on that mailing list. But <laughs> I was so excited that yeah. at least 20 people signed up for it. <laughs> that I wasn't going into this like in the complete darkness and like with nobody knowing who I was. Um, so it definitely took that time to like build. 
And yeah, and then I was, how I was saying, figuring out how I was going to add more inventory into my shop so it didn't look so sad. And <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so then I opened my Etsy shop like six months later. But nice. it, it was a lot of prep work. So doing your research, setting a deadline for yourself. Yeah, that's um, really so, important. Yeah, it really is. Because um, then wait, you'll just let it slip. Yeah, yeah, if you don't set a deadline, then it's just kind of like, oh, I'll do it later, I'll do it later, I'll do it later. And then you just never get it done. And then it never yeah. happens. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to, like, this, this made me think when you did go live in January, because you told everybody that you were going to go live in January, mm -hmm. did you feel like you knew everything and had it all in place? I felt like I was about as prepared as I could possibly be because uh -huh. it's so new. Um, you don't know everything that's going to happen and you only learn by doing mm -hmm. or as you go. Um, plus when I opened, it was just crickets. I was checking my Etsy shop like every five minutes to see how many <laughs> views I got. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was like one view in one day and I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> but I'll get better. <laughs> Go to bed all crushed. Oh, man. Yeah. I don't know. In my head, I just pictured like a massive wave of people just ready to like buy things and it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you deal with, um, with that feeling, with the disappointment of it not being an immediate success? Um, I did get a little obsessive for like maybe like the first week. I kept like checking constantly and I was like hey learning about keywords and like updating things and stuff so I was just really just trying to play more within the Etsy system to see how I could bump up my views mm -hmm. um, and hopefully get a sale which I did probably at the end of the month or like four weeks later I got my first sale nice. so it, it wasn't too long after <laughs> and how, how much was that print with how, what was the dollar amount of that first print Oh gosh, um, it was a good size print. It was, I think, it was like a sixteen by twenty, and I don't even think I charged that much. I know I for sure definitely undercharged. Um, I want to say maybe like forty dollars, uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> which is a big difference to what I charge now. Mm -hmm. um, so how much? How much do you charge for prints now? Uh, they start off at uh twenty four dollars for a six by six and then they go up into like the thousand right so yeah i love it what it is <laughs> so from so from first forty dollar sale now you've got a thriving business um my buddy jason van orden uh who is a longtime friend and a, a well-known internet marketing coach he calls that the money milestone like the first time that you wake up and you've got that email in your inbox and it yeah. says you've got money like some you made your first sale <laughs> Um, and you didn't talk to the person, right? Yeah. Uh, that That is an incredible feeling. Um, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. And you're like I, a stranger who's not my family member has bought something from me because they <laughs> like it. <laughs> so um, from there, you have gr not only grown, you're not only offering more prints and larger prints and more expensive prints, but you have uh, diversified your income stream to be more than just an Etsy shop. So give us an overview of what your business looks like now, like all the different ways that you sell and ways you make money. Mm -hmm. So I still have the Etsy shop um, and uh, it's it's been a, a battle. Not that I don't like Etsy. I do love it for all of the amazing opportunities it has given me over the years, but the Etsy fees kill me. And um, it's, it's Etsy branding. So when people find you on Etsy, they'll never say, oh, I bought it off of Prima Studio. They'll always say, oh, I got this on Etsy. And so your name kind of gets lost um, in that mix. And so I've really been trying to move towards my own shop. And slowly over the years, I have been able to convert more people into my own Shopify shop. And so I sell on there and then I have the Society6 shop, which is passive income. I also sell on Minted, which is another passive income um, source, <clears throat> um, as well as on Saatchi, Artfinder, 
and um, I am I'm represented. Sorry, I'm represented by a gal a reprodu reproduction gallery in New York, and so that's another source of passive income. I'm about to sign on with another reproduction gallery in Texas, and then. I'm about to sign on with an agency who rents out art for film and commercial projects. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So this that's, is awesome. Yeah. So I'm like trying to spread it myself as much as I can. Like, mm -hmm. don't want to have your eggs all in one basket, as they mm -hmm. say. And I try to keep that in mind. Nice. So how did, walk us through how the, all this came out. So you had the Etsy shop and then you realized that the Etsy branding was a problem. Um, and so then you started your own site and you said you built your site on Shopify. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you get people to go from buying stuff on Etsy to buying stuff on your website? Pinterest. Mm -hmm. Pinterest has been a big, uh, it's my number one source on my Shopify and Instagram as well. But the thing with Instagram is that then people Google me and then they find the Etsy and for some reason they'll go to the Etsy instead. Mm -hmm. But with Pinterest, they see the pin and it's directly linked to my Shopify. So then mm -hmm. they're there and I got them. <laughs> nice. So people, so people are on Pinterest and Pinterest is a visual search engine. So people are, um, I'm guessing that people are just searching for various kinds of art on Pinterest and they find you that way or how do they find you on Pinterest? Yeah, I've been playing a lot with um, different keywords and different wordings and things, and as well as like the... Um, the wordings of the titles of your pins. Yes, mm -hmm. and the meta tags that I have on each of my images within Shopify um, so that all the wording is already done for them and they all have to do is just click pin. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so adding different kinds of hashtags and words and things. And I kind of grew my Pinterest organically so I think mixing in, um, I have an art board called Art Love and it has my art, but as like, it also has tons of other artists on there that I love mm -hmm. and that I think also complements my work. So. So you're, um, are you, is this a board that you're creating or is it a group board that a lot of people are contributing to? Oh, it's just my board. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so if people even find something from another artist that I've pinned and then they go onto my art love uh, Pinterest board, then they'll see like my work incorporated in there and there's chances that they'll click on it. I and think this is, so I just want, I just want to interject like the, did you get that idea from Etsy or where did you come up with the idea to create a curated board like that? Um, I think I might've heard it in passing some, something along the lines of not being like super promotional and not all about me, 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 because you want to give more than what you're asking people for. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I naturally just, I, I love other people's work. So it's not hard for me to um, share other artists that I love. So. Nice. Yeah. The, the reason I ask is the craft community seems to be a lot better about creating curated lists and Pinterest boards and other things like that of other people's work that they enjoy. I see artists doing that a lot less than mm -hmm. I see craft, than I see craft people doing that. And I think it's a great way of, you know, sharing the love and spreading the word about each other's work. I'd love to yeah. see more artists doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely. And you know what I have, I have mm -hmm. a separate board that has only my artwork on it and it doesn't do as well as uh, the one that has like all of the other artists incorporated into it. And I think it, it just feels more organic for the user. Um, and it doesn't feel so salesy, mm -hmm. which is kind of what we're always trying to get away from. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, okay. So you've got Pinterest. So, so most of your traffic to your own website comes from Pinterest. Mm -hmm. Um, but then you've also got an Etsy, you've got an Instagram and a Facebook account, and then okay, so you you also mentioned that you have a Shopify, not Shopify, uh, Society Six page. Yeah. 
And most people, like you said that you make a, a few thousand dollars a month off the of Society6. Most people who have a Society6 page or some other marketplace page, whether it's Saatchi or ArtFinder or whatever, they might make one sale a month and make a few dollars. So how did you crack the code on <laughs> Society6? Um, so it's really where you focus your time, where you're going to see your results. Mm -hmm. um, and Society6 felt sort of natural for me because there, I had a lot of work that I liked, but I, it didn't necessarily fit within my own shop or the Etsy shop. So Society6 crowd is a little bit younger um, and I thought it worked perfectly for there. So I started uploading that work on there and I updated it a um, few times a month. And mm -hmm. like it does, it takes time to build. It's not passive income is definitely not like a. You didn't start the page a month ago. Yeah, it's definitely not like you put this up tomorrow and you're going to be like a gazillionaire then by the end of the week. It definitely doesn't work like that. So probably like the first month I made like $9 and then the next month I made like 15 bucks and so on and so forth. And it just kept going and it probably took about a year, year and a half to get into like the hundreds. Mm -hmm. And then they, there was one print that I uploaded and that's why it's so important to just share your work because you never know what's going to stick. There was one print that I uploaded and Etsy or not Etsy, sorry, Society6 loved it and they put it on their own like curated selection of prints mm. and um, people started finding it, buying it. And that month it went from a couple hundred to like the thousand mark. And I was like, right. I was just <laughs> like blown. Yeah. So, and it just, it hasn't slowed down since then. And I just keep updating it. Um, a couple times a month just to like maintain and refresh and add more things. And like I said, you never know what's going to stick. Sometimes you think something that you really personally love is going to work and is going to sell out and it doesn't. And then something that you're kind of like, Oh, that's cool. And then everyone's like, Oh my gosh, I love this. I need to have it. So <laughs> yeah. I love it. So consistently publishing your work, consistently showing people what you're doing. Um, it seems to me like you are pretty comfortable online. Is that a fair assessment? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I've um, never, yeah, I've, I think I told you earlier, like I've never done any art shows. I haven't done any art fairs. Mm -hmm. Being an introvert, like just like paralyzes me thinking about doing things like that. So the internet's like where I live. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so how much time do you spend online? like doing, doing non-art related activities like Reddit or some other thing that people like us who spend all their time online doing? Um, probably not that much. I not think much. most of the things yeah. I do online are uh -huh. business related. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, other than like Facebook for, you know, catching up with people and things. Right. So how did you become so comfortable online then? I think it had to do with the fact that when I was, well, I grew up in the 90s. So like the 90s was like, I think the turning point for the internet where it was just like becoming this thing, right? And so that's when everyone's like exploring and um, I just became fascinated with technology at a young age. So it just kind of became natural for me to be a part of all of like the internet things that were happening. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah, the so and there are a lot of people in our community who tell me, oh, I don't like being online. I don't like the internet. I have a hard time with internet tools. So the <clears throat> I don't know. You know, I don't want to be ageist and say like you're just good at the internet because you're young. Um, <laughs> but I, there is, you know, there's. I think it's a matter of um, openness and w willingness to experiment with the tools and yeah. not be so worried about getting it wrong or whatever. Um, so you also mentioned that you have done some work with anthropology. Um, you told me earlier they found you on Etsy. Mm -hmm. So you did a, a, a pillow licensing deal with them. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. So I had done a little print collection of animals, animal silhouettes. Um, mm -hmm. 
and on the inside they had like a pattern and then it had like flowers and it was all within the shape of the animal and they found me i guess like their talent scouts found me through etsy and they were particularly in interested in one of them and i had a meeting with them in la mm -hmm. and i took my little ipad and I had like a little portfolio set up. I had never done anything like that before. So I was super nervous and I was like, well, maybe they might like other things. So I'm gonna show them what else I have. Um, and so I was talking to them and they were telling me why they liked it. And I was like, well, I have like these other animals that I did too. And so they ended up picking two of them. And then um, they said that the whole process took like a year. Mm -hmm. to set in and I wasn't allowed to say anything until it came out <laughs> uh, but definitely the whole process felt surreal and the, I had to sign a contract uh, and like a non-competing clause and all that stuff um, but yeah that was really exciting nice <laughs> so, see, so much of, of your success has just been showing up every day publishing your stuff every day and yeah. interacting with your people every day. Definitely. It, like I said, wherever you spend most of your time mm -hmm. is where you're going to find your success or not. I mean, if you don't show up, people aren't going to know who you are. Um, so it definitely, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of patience, definitely a lot of patience <laughs> and you, and a lot of faith, to believe that you can do it and that you have what it takes to do it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So just. When you were getting started, I mean, I, I'm assuming you had some sort of day job or something. So how did you manage your time? Like, how did you not burn out and exhaust yourself in doing in, in showing up every day? Um, I did. <laughs> you hustle 24 seven until you can't anymore. Uh -huh. uh, I, I, well, here's a fun fact. I've never had like an outside job before. I've always been self-employed. So, um, I was a web designer, graphic designer, uh, for like five years before I started this. Um, and so I was juggling two businesses at the same time. But working from home, I was able to kind of like switch back and forth easily between the two. Uh, so that definitely helped a lot. But it was, I pretty much had like no social life. I was just like locked in, sitting at my desk, just working, 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 working. Yeah. Trying yeah. to, yeah. It, it, it's definitely, in the beginning, it's a lot of hustle. It's a lot of hustle, but then eventually you kind of have to realize that you can't continue like that or you're going to burn out. <laughs> Let me ask you this. What percentage of your time do you spend on the business side of, of your art business versus actually making art? Uh, it's in the beginning, I felt like it was disproportionate. I felt there was a time where it was so much business. It was like bookkeeping and emails and updating and I, I i i felt like i wasn't a creative person anymore and i was just kind of like a business manager for somebody else's business <laughs> um and so i really had to rethink and reassess um how i envisioned my business and how mm -hmm. i envisioned the life that i was creating because i totally forgot that being a uh, creative entrepreneur, you can create the life you want to live, right? You have that chance, you have the opportunity, but when you're working from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep, you just, you just forget. Um, so I definitely had to reassess and I streamlined a lot of my uh, business things. So a lot of automating and um, I hired like a bookkeeper, I hired an accountant and all that stuff. Um, so that I could focus more time on creating. So right now it's probably like 60% creating, 40% like business. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Um, I imagine at some point it was probably 80 or 90% of your time business stuff. Yeah. Especially yeah. when you're trying to figure out like the logistics of everything. 
-hmm. So like, how am I going to ship this? How much is that going to cost? And like, how do I do that? And you just have like a thousand million questions that you don't have the answers to. And so you got to look for them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is something that I, I hear a lot when I'm talking to people. There's my cat. Uh, <laughs> talking to people and answering questions and coaching calls and stuff like a lot of artists talk in general terms about, oh, you need to spend more time marketing or you need to spend more time on business. But then when we put a number of hours on it or a percentage, um, you know, like if, if we say you need to spend 20 hours a week marketing and doing business stuff versus spending a lot. I think that's generally been a wake up call for a lot of artists because they don't understand how much time it takes in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And even having like a, a time tracker on like your web browser or something to track mm -hmm. where you're spending your time is really helpful. Yeah. And it and it becomes helpful in the long run when you're like, I have this task and I know it's only going to take me 10 minutes. But before I thought it was going to take me like all day. Uh -huh. So <laughs> just kind of like putting things into perspective. Do you have a favorite time tracker that you use? Um, I just found one. It's called Rescue Time. I love Rescue Time. Yeah. 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 My, my sister told me about that. And yes. uh, it's definitely been helpful with the yeah, analytics. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For those who don't know Rescue Time, uh, you download it and install it, and it tracks everything you do on your computer, um, including programs you're using and which uh, websites you visit. And then it will spit out a, a report for you at the end of the month uh, and, show it, and it'll show you how much time you actually spent on Facebook versus how much time you think you spent on Facebook. Right. <laughs> You're like, what? I was only on there for five minutes. I wasn't there yeah. all day. <laughs> yeah. 100%. I was there for six hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Rescue time is the name of it. Wander asked, what was the name? Rescue time. It's not a mobile app. It's a, it's a program that you download for your computer. Yeah. And the cool thing about that too, is that you can set goals and working hours. So say you always work from um, like 10 to five or whatever, mm -hmm. then it tracks that time. Like this is supposed to be your productivity time. Um, and you see how far uh, you're into your goal or if you just missed it completely. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That is, I, I love that. And then also um, tracking studio time is important too. Do you do you track your studio time? Uh, no, I try not to place like a restriction on that because um, for me, creating is like super spontaneous. I can't mm -hmm. just like go in there and I'm like, I'm going to make things today because then I'll just sit there staring at everything. I was like, I don't need <laughs> Or if I do make something, I'm like, man, this looks like I don't even know how to paint. So, <laughs> <laughs> so when I have like that feeling like, oh my gosh, I need to make, I just, I drop everything and I start, I start making and I don't give myself a time limit. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. good. Um, that there's one other app that I wanted to mention since Wanru is asking questions about this. Uh, there's an app called self control, uh, that I love for the Mac. Uh, I, I don't know if there's a windows uh, version or not, but for self control, you can create a blacklist of websites and mm -hmm. set a timer. Uh, so it like for me, my blacklist is Reddit, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and Gmail so that I can't check email. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I set it for like two hours so that I have to do like more important, more pr productive, productive, creative work. Um, and I can't access any of those sites. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I've definitely I like heard that. of stuff like that. And like even putting, like putting your phone in a drawer and just like away. Mm -hmm. So you're not checking it all the time. Yeah. yeah. Turning off all your notifications. Yes. Yeah. Those are definitely time sucks. And even though you don't think that you're on there for too long, it just, it adds up and you're like looking at Instagram and all of a sudden you're also on Facebook and then Pinterest and <laughs> yeah, just comes yeah. On. <laughs> getting stuck in the loop, like Charlie over at productive flourishing. Uh, he calls that the, the loop. Um, yeah. you're like, I'm going to just, I'm just going to check Facebook. And then you see somebody shared something from Instagram. So then you go to Instagram yeah. and then you see something on Instagram that you like, so you Google it and then you're like, what was I doing? Oh, right. I was on Facebook. And then you start, the whole thing yeah. over again. Yeah. yeah. And so. you know, I speaking of productivity, I've also been trying the Pomodoro um mm -hmm. 
effect or uh, what is it, whatever it's called. Pomodoro technique, yeah. Yeah. And I how feel do you, like- And how do you apply that? Um, I give myself, I have a little timer on my phone. So I'm like, okay, I have 30 minutes and just focus on this. And then I, I do, I like shut everything down. I put things away and I try to focus on everything. Um, and I've also been reading the four hour work week. So I have that like in my head, mm -hmm. like I only want to work four hours a week. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, good. Yeah. The four hour work week was um, one of the first entrepreneurship books that I ever read back when I was first trying to figure out how to run a business. Yeah. It, it definitely led me down the path to finding lots of cool resources. Yeah. It's very, it's very interesting. I feel like he kind of takes it to the extreme, but, sure. um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but there's definitely some good techniques in there um, to kind of streamline your business. Yep. Shannon McFarland says that your, your work seems like it has a beautiful balance. Your, your life seems like it has a beautiful balance. So, Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Awesome. Um, Wander, yes, Four Hour Work Week. Um, that is the name of the book by Tim Ferriss, F E R R I S. Um, so we'll include links to all of these resources in the show notes. Um, this is really, really useful, practical advice. So thank you so much, Patricia, for taking the time. Um, if somebody wants to uh, learn more about you or see your work uh, or just stalk you on the internet, where should they go? Um, you can find me on Instagram at, at Parima Studio, which maybe we should type that out because people always misspell it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or you can find me on primastudio.com. And I also have a separate website for my originals at patriciavargas.com. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, well, we'll definitely have links to all of those. Parima is spelled P-A-R-I-M-A. -A. Yes. Yeah. Um, Parima and we'll have links to all those in the show notes so Patricia and thank you so much for taking the time and uh, we'll let you go yes it was a pleasure thank you you bet have a great day <laughs> you too bye, -bye.